Ruchim Aboim B'Shem Irgin Shir Tair Moses Pasul. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's drasha. Might be Rigish Akerach. The response of tonight's drasha by Elam B'Shem Lui Nishmas Rav Chaim Yitzchak Ben Rav Israel Shvain Levracha and Rav Moshe Ben Rav Shloima Shvain Levracha. Since the same tours but Sarah Chaim to have the great schools to sponsor a Shir Kol Irgin Shir Tair at seven one eight eight five one eight six five one. Email ist at yeshivanet.com. As you may have seen in the posters, Irgin Shirtel will be holding its annual dinner on August 18th, Young Israel Avenue K. Due to space limitations, event is for men only. We'll be publishing a journal on the occasion. It's a perfect opportunity to um, honor whichever abonim whose year we've enjoyed. I have a chaving on a bus of Torah of Irgin Shirtel throughout the year by putting an ad in the journal. You can call 718-851-8651 or email ist at yeshivanet.com. Tonight we have the covered have with us once again Rosh Hashem and Deutschem, the Living Torah Museum, which is famous for bringing uh, Torah and Gemara and Yiddishkeit alive for tens of thousands of Yidin. The museum is located in Borough Park on 16th Avenue, 41st Street. Is it reopened already after Corona? It's already open, Baruch Hashem, after the Coronas is a Caskell branch, and uh, there'll be uh, the new Sefer from Deutsch on the Living Terror on the Parsha series from uh, Bamidbar, will be available as well as the one on Bracious, which covers the Kalim from the, that will be covered in tonight's Russia. It's my cover to call on by Deutsch for tonight's year. When we think of music, we think about celebration. But in fact, music wasn't always about celebration. And as we will discuss tonight, there was times that music was used as a way of crying in funerals. There was music that was used as celebration. There was musical sounds that was used as a means of communication. So we have a pasuk, the beginning of Bereshis, v'shem ochiv yuval, hu avi. He is the father of Kol Tovris Kinar and Ugov. The yuval was the founder of musical instruments. Moshe Rabbeinu has a special command. By the Rabbeinu Shalolim, Asay Lecha, make from you, Shtei Chatzoytzeres, you should make two trumpets. And these trumpets should be made of silver. And we will discuss in a few minutes that Yosef and Josephus, in the end of Bayesheni, describes the Chatzoytzeres of Moshe Rabbeinu. And why Moshe Rabbeinu had to make these trumpets from his own money. And he had a commandment before he dies that he must bury these trumpets. Why couldn't Moshe Rabbeinu keep these trumpets for future generations? And it wasn't only the, at this point in time that Moshe Rabbeinu made things. Moshe Rabbeinu made other musical instruments. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Gemara says, made symbols. Famous story in the Gemara that the symbols of Moshe Rabbeinu had cracked. And they went to Alexandria, Egypt to get the best experts from Alexandria, Egypt to help fix these symbols. But the sound was no longer good. And they took off all the corrections that were made and left Moshe symbol as is. So why is it that symbols were allowed to be made by Moshe and Moshe Rabbeinu did not have to bury them? But when it came to the Chatzotus, he did. Musical instruments are certain Places had certain instruments that had specific names. And for many, many years, 
people were not sure what these instruments were. And recently, in the last two decades, with the help of Rabbi Yisrael Belsky, I was able to solve what these instruments were. So let's go all the way back. Let's start with Yuval. Yuval is the Avi called Teufis Kinar Ve'ugav. He is the father of musical instruments. So what is a Kinar? What is this thing that we call Kinar? Is it a harp? Is it a lyre? What did it look like? In my book, Ambracious, I show you the oldest kinar in the world. It was stolen from the Iraqi National Museum. This is the oldest kinar in the world. During the invasion of Iraq, it went missing. Until then, it was on display in the Baghdad Museum. I'm going to show you a picture of David HaMelech that Yidin drew much later. And you will see that David's kinar, as the Yidin imagined it 2,000 years ago, was not that different. A mosaic floor was found in a synagogue in Gaza in 1965. This is the first picture with the sand still covering part of the mosaic before the Arabs decided to destroy part of the mosaic. David Amelech's name is spelled Dalit Vav Yud Dalit, as we find many times in Divrei Hayomim that David is spelled Dalit Vav Yud Dalit B'moloi. And there's a depiction of David Amelech. What happened? The Arabs decided to rub out those mosaic tiles with David's face. So then the next step was they had this mosaic of David HaMelech without his face. But based on the actual picture that was once existent, that I just showed you, with the sand still on it, they redid the mosaic. And this is today in the Israel Museum. So we know basically that David played a kinar. Shimon Bar Kochva minted coins during his revolt against the Romans, 60 years after the Chorban of the Beis Hamikdash. And he made coins with a picture of the kinar, the navel, and the shtei chatzaitzris. And I have some of the coins here. So we have a general idea of what the kinar looked like as it was made by Goyim or as it was even made by Yidin. In the palace of Sancher of Melech Asher was a room that Sancher depicted his capture of the city of Lachish. And in it he has ancient Jews holding kinars on their hands and playing it as they are being marched into Gullus. So we have an idea from multiple sources of what the kinar would have looked like. Now the kinar had many different amounts of strings. It says, La'asid lavoi, there's going to be a kinar of shmoyne ni'imim, of eight strings. Till then it was seven strings. There's a kind of kinar that could have had ten strings. We're not going to get into that as well right now. So we have an idea what the kinar and navel would have looked like. The shtei chatzoitzris that Moshe made, Yosefen tells us the following. It's one of the most fascinating things in the entire Yosefen. Yosefen says, relating to the kinar of Moshe Rabbeinu, 
Each of the trumpets were a little less than one amma long. Chazaynish, an amma is 22 inches. Rabchaim no, it's 19. It was a little less than an amma long, a little thicker than an ordinary flute with a bell-like tip. It was like an open bell. This is the coin of Bar Kochva showing the bell-like tip of the kinar that was made by Moshe. What's that? I, I said the chatzotzes, the chatzotzes that were made. Now in the base Hamigdash, there was a kinar and there were chatzotzes. And the chatzotzes in the base Hamish was used not only for the Levine to play, but there was another use as well. On Arab Shabbos, like you have a Shabbos alarm, they had a part of the roof of the Heichel, which was called the Beis Hatkia. And they would blow three sets of blowing. This is a diagram made by Machan Hamigdash of Beis Hatkia. And the Koyin standing on top of Beis Hatkia and blowing the Chatzotzeres. They actually found a stone that says on it, Le Beis Hatkia. This is a part of the Beis Hamigdash. An actual part of Beis Hatkia. Now, where was Beis Hatkia located? As you can see in this illustration here, there was an indentation so the Kaya wouldn't fall over. And on the inside, it would have said, Le Beis Hatkia, right there. And that's where the Kayin would stand. Moshe Rabbeinu had to communicate with Kalal Yisrael. If they blew one Tkia with two Chatzotzeres, it meant that the Kalal Yisrael should all come to the Mishkan. If they blew one Tkia with one trumpet, it meant that the Nesim should come to the Mishkan. When they had to travel, they had a whole system of blowing the chatzotzeres. Pack up, get ready to leave. First group, start marching. This was a means of communication. Today, lifeguards have a whistle. You ask any kid who goes to camp, what is... A quick blow from the whistle means he tells you, buddy up, a long whistle out of the pool. You have communication today with whistles. Whistles were used as well in Tanakh. When David HaMelech brought the Aaron to Yerushalayim, it says they played a musical instrument called the Mashrukisa. What's a Mashrukisa? So the Shulti Hagibarim, the Sefer Shulti Hagibarim, not on the riff, I'm talking about the Sefer, the full Sefer Shulti Hagibarim Asholim, that was written by Rabbi Avram Portilion. He writes that Lishrok means to whistle, and Mashrukisas were whistles. So they had whistles as a means of a musical instrument. You could play Happy Birthday on it with a whistle, you could play songs with a whistle. Or you could make sounds with a whistle. And this is what it's referring to. On Shar Titus in Rome, there is a picture of the menorah being carried. And as I explained last time, the menorah on Shar Titus is not the menorah of the base Hamigdash. And we have many proofs to that. Number one. The menorah on Shar Titus has dragons on the base. The menorah base you shouldn't have any animals on it. Now one Mephoyer says that these three levels 
is what the minar of the base Hamidish look like. Now one Mefarish. They all knew about Chartitas. They used to torture Jews. You had to go see Chartitas. But now one Mefarish says that that was the minar. So we believe that the minar and Chartitas was a decoy. Not only do I believe it, but there's a very funny and famous story. When the state of Israel was established in 1948, Ben-Gurion took the menorah of Shartitus as a symbol of Israel. Rav Shleimah Goren wrote a letter to Ben-Gurion in which he says, why did you take the menorah of Shartitus as the symbol of Israel? It's a treif in a menorah, it's not a real menorah. The Tug Margen Journal had an article about this. Rabbi Yossel Ashkenazi, who was the Satmar Rebbe's Gabbai, in the end of his life, he was an Eshel Avram in Williamsburg. And I used to spend a lot of time with him talking about history. So he told me that the morning that the Tug Margen Journal published this article about the letter from Rabbi Shleimah Goren to Ben Gurion, he cut out the article of the newspaper and when the Satmar Rebbe Rabbi Yoel used to take off his tefillin, he used to slide down sometimes an interesting article in a newspaper. He said, the Satmar Rebbe read the article and he said, No, a treif in the Medina, at kinem and a treif in the Menoira, al sit simbal, matza min beminoi. That's what Satmar Rebbe said. So, this is not my Chiddush that the Menoira and Shartitus is not the real Menoira. People knew about it years ago. The Yidden knew that the real Kalim were going to be put away. So wherever they could, they made something that anyone in the future generations is going to see, is going to know it's not the real thing. I'll give you an example from the Quran. I don't know if any of you have read the Quran. I did. I read the Quran. There's an amazing thing written in the Quran. Muhammad was illiterate. He had a Yid who used to write for him. It says in the Quran that Ahasuerus received from Paroi such and such. Every Yid who hears it knows it's a Chuchat Lullah. But it's a Befeirishal writing in the Quran. The Pshat is sometimes Yidin did things that they could show in the future that we know this is not the real thing. We see it in another example as well. I'm diverting from musical instruments, but I'll get back to it in a second. There's a question in the Gemara, if the tzitz was written Kodesh Hashem, Beshura Achas, or Beshtei Shuras? Was the tzitz written on one line, Kodesh Hashem, or on two lines? Amar Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Lezer says, Ha'yisi b'roimi, I was in Rome. I saw the tzitz and it's my shita. Where did Rabbi Lezer see the tzitz? In Rome there was a museum. It was a public place. It was called the Temple of Peace. Not a temple for prayer. They called it the Temple of Peace. It would be like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Big museum. Every time Rome conquered a province, a country, they would take treasures from that country and put it on public display there. So Rabbi Lezer went to Rome and he saw the tzitz and it was like Yeshita and we don't pass him like Rabbi Lezer. We have a klal in Shas. If one person says, I heard about it. One person says, I saw it. Who do we believe? The person who saw it. So why don't we pass him like Rabbi Lezer? Ha guferaya, that whatever the Romans took were not necessarily the right thing. I have a good friend, Professor Stephen Fine, and he actually did an amazing thing. He went to Shartitus and he studied under special microscopes. He studied the pigments that once were on Shartitus. The pigments of the colors that were on Shartitus. And he made this rendering. It's in my new book. 
of what Shartitas used to look like when it was colored. A lot of detail can now be seen. One of them is this shulchan with two chatzotzeres sticking out. If you look at the chatzotzeres, here it seems to be accurate because the chatzotzeres seem to be an arm long, a bell shaped at the center that is larger than the standard trumpet. So I could say Shartitas did Chatzotis look correct, but the Menorah doesn't look correct. How did Moshe Rabbeinu make the Chatzotis? Miksha Tasa Oisai, Rashi says he took this tool. This is called a Kornus Shel Zahavim. This was a goldsmith's hammer. He would have heated up the silver when the tilly got very hot. And then, once he heated the silver, he bangs out the piece of silver. If you take pliers, or in the ancient world, you take a tzavas, tweezers, you can bend the silver. And by using the silver and bending it, you could make it bell-shaped. And therefore, between using a corner shell zahavim, a goldsmith's hammer, and between using tweezers, you could bend the silver into shape. And Moshe Rabbeinu made it from one single piece of silver. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu have to bury the chatzotzes? Because the chatzotzes became a personal item for Moshe Rabbeinu. Asay lecha, make it for you. You, as the leader, needs to communicate with Kala Yisrael. You, as the leader, have to do it. So Moshe had to do it from his own. Why couldn't he use public funds? What happens if Moshe Rabbeinu is once going to call Klal Yisrael, and he shouldn't have called Klal Yisrael, and he used the trumpets, he's a Moel Behegdish. So Moshe Rabbeinu needed to make it Asay Lecha. He had to make it for him. Any other thing Moshe Rabbeinu made, he made it for the Mishkan. He made it for Klal Yisrael. Asay Lecha. Make it for you. So why does he have to bury it? Because we have our locha. Rashi says, Vayehi bishurun melech melamed shemoshe rabbeinu nikra melech. Moshe rabbeinu had a din of a king. What do you do with all of the artifacts that belongs to a king when the king dies? Everything gets destroyed or buried. So nobody in the future should say, I have a chafetz from a king. Since Moshe Rabbeinu had a din of a melech, Vayihi b'shur melech, melamed shu Moshe Rabbeinu, nikra melech, Moshe Rabbeinu had a chiyuv the day before he's going to pass away to bury his chasoitzers. Every day in davening, you say, hallelujah, b'tzil tzilei shama. Hallelujah, but still it's lay srua. Baruch atah, the inayil hina melchelem shahakam the midvar. People daven their whole lives have no idea what silt lay shama is or what silt lay srua. So let me show you. The shilti agibarim says there's two kinds of symbols that you need to see. These were found in a shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea. The coral is still on it. One side had a hole. One side has an extra piece. 2,000 years ago, these two symbols were attached together on one side. And how did they play it? This was a beat symbol. What is the sound of a trua? Tu, 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 This was your beat symbol. This was Silsalei Trua. Hap. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Is it your birthday? No? Okay. This is the Milsa de Beducha, so you have to be Yoitza. So this is Tzil Trua. This was your beat symbol. Tzil, oh, it's your birthday. Mazal Egoive. Tzil Tzilei Shama. Crashing symbol. Shama, because you hear it loud. Shulte Gibarim says that's Tzil Tzilei Shama. He's here. We're made to crash. The coral's still on them. I don't want to crash them too hard. Here you can see how symbols can crack. They break. So when you learn about the symbols of Moshe Rabbeinu that what needed to be repaired, this is a very in interesting. From the time of Moshe Rabbeinu till the, to the second base Hamigdash was a Meshach's man that it needed repair. Here's a third kind of symbol called Mitzal Taim. Vaham Shoirim, Haman, Asa, Ve'eson, B'mitzal Taim, Nechoshes La'ashmiya. Right here you can see the holes. There used to be a stick. The Israel Museum has one with the stick still attached. Those sticks went between your fingers. And when you play them, you can make a hard sound like this. You can make a sweet sound. It's more high pitch sound. So the way you hit it made different coilers, different sounds. So you have Tzilzalei Shama, Tzilzalei Srua, and Mitzal Taim. One of the greatest mistakes that Malam de make when they teach Chomish is Shiras Hayam. Vateitsena kol hanoshim achareho besupim uvimachoyles. Two years ago when I spoke here, I brought along an Egyptian hieroglyphics dictionary and showed you that the word toif means something beaten, like a drum. Sim, tambourine, drum, something beaten is a toif in hieroglyphics. What does the word machel mean? So everyone teaches machel means dancing. There's only one little problem. I was nine years old and I was a kid who asked a lot of questions in class. So one hand, my rabbi tells me that Rasa Shifcha la Yam, that a Shifcha maidservant saw on the Yam what Yecheskel ben Buzi did not see in later generations. And on the other hand, my rabbi told me that the women were dancing. So I called my rabbi a liar. She's a liar. You're telling me this Navua, that such a thing? I told him, you're lying to me. So I got kicked out of class. The Manal wanted to know why I was out of class. I told him, maybe you could explain it to me. So he told me in Yiddish, when the Vesvarin Alta was the Fashtain. Baruch Hashem, he was right. The Shilti Hagiburim writes that he went to Egypt. And he found there's a musical instrument called a machel. Vehine ha mochel nikra beloshen yavon, sistron, perike of shar hashir. In Greek, the name of this musical instrument is called a sistron. In Egyptian hieroglyphics, it's called a mochel. What happened? Words have a way of changing. So if I call up my good friend Rabbi Alt and say, Rabbi Alt, I'm sending you something tomorrow, FedEx. And he's going to say, great. But what I said didn't make any sense. I should have said I'm going to send it overnight. But FedEx is so well known to send overnight packages, we interchange the word FedEx for overnight. I'll Xerox it instead of copy it. I'll Google it instead of search it. 
So the action becomes the name. So he says, And with this musical instrument, they started dancing. So after a while, they started calling Machal to be dancing. But when you daven, and you say hallelujah, how does dancing get in the middle of hallelujahs? Narvas is talking about this musical instrument. So this is an Egyptian machal. And right before Corona, I got another one. A Greek machal. Again, so this answers the kasha. The women never danced. They played the musical instrument, the machal. I, the Pasik says, the Gemara says, Asa Kaddish Baruch Hu, Asa Mechalat Sadiqim. That's the secondary use of the word. Now I want to talk to you about another very, very complicated musical instrument. I'm going to show you a picture of it. It's called the double flute. This is a painted fresca that has survived 2,000 years. And what we believe that this musical instrument is called nechilois. When you say in Tanakh nechilois, it's a double flute. And this is the flute that we are referring to. What did Avram Avinu do? Avram Avinu took every part of the aisle and he conserved it. From the horns, he made shoifers. The left shoifer of the aisle of Avram Avinu, they blew him by mountain tire. The right shoifer is going to be blown when Mashiach will come, a ram's big horn. A lot of people mistakenly make pictures they put a big Yemenite shoifer that that's Tkabe shoifer God l'b'cheresenu. That's a that's not a lachatchila shoifer b'chalal. The Jews of Yemen only used the kudu shoifer because rams were not available in Yemen. When they came to Eretz Yisrael and they came to America, they started changing. On Rosh Hashanah they use a shoifer shel ayil. Bar mitzvahs, Elul, they used the long shoifers. Not to be moitzi laz on a minikad moinim. But the Medrash says that the shoifer shel Mashiach is going to be the right shoifer of the Akeda. What did Avram Avinu do with the bones of the legs of the aisle, of the rams? He made chalilim. He made flutes. This is in my museum. It's not from Avram Avinu. But it's a 3,000-year-old flute made from the bone of a cow. This is one in the Israel Museum, a flute made from the bone of a ram. Not from Avram, but it's an ancient musical instrument. I had a professor at the Oriental Institute in Chicago who once came to my museum and played for us a bone flute. What did Avram Avinu do with the skin of the aisle? He made drums. Before Corona, I visited an Indian tribe called the Cherokee Indians. And they told me that they still to today make drums using the skin of a ram. 100-year-old drum used by the American Indians from the skin of a ram. This one, they shaved off all of the hair and smoothed it out. This second drum still has the hair of the animal on it. And for those of you who learned Af Yoimi, I'm now going to demonstrate something that the Gemara says. You still can see the holes 
where the hair used to be and it was not smoothed out. So when we learn Shabbos and Daf Yoimi, the Gemara makes an Afkemina between whether or not the skin has been smoothed or it still has the original holes from where it was. Kids like playing these drums. It's an amazing thing. It makes different vibrations, different sounds. But it's something that you can clearly see how people, even a hundred years ago, were doing things similar to what they were doing in the ancient world. There's only one picture of the second base, Hamigdash, that we know is accurate. It was made by Shimon Bar Kochva. This coin shows a picture of the Heichel of the Beis Hamikdash. The Oren and the Kruvim in the middle. The Badei HaOren at the center. Why did Bar Kochva make these coins with the Kinar, the Nevel, the Shteichat Soitzris, the Heichel? He was trying to get people inspired to revolt against the Romans. Rabbi Akiva thought that Bar Kochva would be Mashiach at the beginning of the revolt. On here it says, Shimon Nasi Yisrael in Ksavivri. And those of you who don't know what Ksavivri means, in my book on Bereshis, I teach you how to read Ksavivri. Aleph Beis Gimel Dalet Hey, Vav Zayin Ches Tes Yud, Chof Lamid Mem Nun Samach, I am paid Sadi Kufresh Shintaf. This is not Chinese. This was script alabase that the Yidin were using. If you open and see a box of Jewish ancient coins, they're all going to be in Ksavivri. Now, there is a Shiloh when Moshe Rabbeinu brought down the Luchas. Were the Luchas written in Ivri or Ashuris? Black letters of script. The Bavli says, the Samach and the Mem Shebeluchos, Benes Hayoimdim. If I were to carve the letter Samach on stone, there'd be a ball in the middle. That ball hung with a Ness. On the the Mem, there'd be a square. That square hung with a Ness. Look at a Samach and Ivri, no middle of the letter. Mem looks like a W and a Y combination. So the Bavli says, this is the Raya, that the Luchas were written in our olive base, not Ksav Ivri. Yerushalmi argues with the Bavli and says the iron of the Luchas hung. So it's a Machloik is Bavli and Yerushalmi. The letters on Bar Kochva's coin are in Ksav Ivri. Shin is the W. Mem is that funny looking W and Y combination. Shim Oi Nasi Yisrael with a picture of the Heichal, the Oren, and the Badim. But you know why I love this coin? For what's on the back. Here's the Machloikis, and every boy who learns Sukkah, and those who are learning now Daf Yoimi, know that this is a Machloikis, how many Hadassim, and how many Aravis do you have in a Lulav? Rabbi Akiva says one Hadas and one Arava. I brought you here this coin tonight for those who learn Daf Yomi. Because on the back of the coin, Bar Kochva made Rabbi Akiva's opinion of a lulav with one hadas and one arava. Bar Kochva liked Rabbi Akiva because Rabbi Akiva supported his revolt. By the way, the Esrik has a gartel. It's a chsidish Esrik, you see? An ancient chsidish Esrik right here. So if somebody comes over to you and says, you have a gesser with a gartel, he says, It's not a new thing. Shimon Bar Kochva's coin, the esser got a gartel. 2,000-year-old coin from Bar Kochva. So even though this is not musical instruments, and we're holding now in Dafyoimi in Sukkah, I figured it was more than appropriate to do that. I'm going to take a couple of questions now. If anyone has any questions, now is the time you could ask any questions about what we spoke about.
Any questions? Silsalate Shama was if you go to a chasana and you see the drum, you know, that's the Silsalate Shama. That's the loud cymbal sound. Silsalate True was a beat cymbal. Drummer has it today. He has a beat cymbal and he has the loud crashing cymbal. These are a little hard to see because they're, you know, this coral on them, they're, they were found in the sea, in Yamatiha in the Mediterranean Sea. So that's why they're a little hard to see. Yes? You're asking a very good question. There is ancient Mesopotamian uh, musical notations, but the problem is we're not sure exactly how to play them. There are some people who study ancient musical sounds, and they're trying to come up with a solution of what, what these mean. But it's not like hieroglyphics that we found in inscription that had the same thing in three languages and we were able to figure out the ABC. With musical instruments, it's a little different because we don't know if what you consider a beat was something that they considered important. So there is a lot of questions relating to the music. What we do know is the tkia, shvarim, true, and tkia, we know that from the Gemara, one was a long sound, and you know, in, there in Poiskim already deal with the Chatzotras and deal with Shoifer and what's considered a tkia, what's considered Shvarim, Mitrua, but that's already more in line with something that's been passed down to us. Is there anything to the um, stories that the Baal Shem Tov heard a flute song? And How can I comment about, about the Baal Shem Tov? I mean, who am I to comment about the Baal Shem Tov? I can't comment about these things. No, no, there, there are people who say that the nigun of Duchening is coming from the Beis Hamikdash. There are things that are written in many different sources uh, that certain songs originated from the Beis Hamikdash. But there's no uh, something that I can tell you that I've seen or I've heard that I can definitively tell you anything uh, and, or comment about it. I only comment on things I know about. Mash any day any any day. I just don't know. Yes. Because this pigmentation that still has survived, uh, how do we know that it was once colored? Um, under very, very high infrared light, you can see the uh, pigmentation that's still there. And that's what Dr. Stephen Fine did. It's a tremendous thing to show us exactly what it once looked like. And that's, and that picture is exactly what it like? Based on the pigmentations. It's, this is in my new book on Bamidbar, which was just published a few weeks ago. If you want to buy the book at the end, it's $35. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the, the term Pari, uh, his question was in defense of Muhammad <laughs> and the Quran. Were in all the kings of Egypt called Pari? The answer is no. Pari was only called to a certain time. The time when they ruled either what was called the old line pharaohs, the Hyksos pharaohs, or the ones who ruled most of Egypt. There was a period of time that they were no longer ruling an entire country. They became like local Pashas, they became local leaders. They were no longer called Paris. In the time of Ahasuerus, there was no Pare anymore. So there's no defense for Muhammad or for the Quran. Yes? Are there any letters in some? No. Matzpanach, the whole thing. You can read about all of my book. I, I talk about Ksavir, the history of Ksavir. Yes? So again, we don't pass in like Yerushalmi. We pass in like the Bavli. But Mitzad Limud, it's important to know. There's a fascinating thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which most people don't even realize. There is a Dead Sea Scroll that every time it says Hashem's name, it says Ksavivri. I was asked by a very big professor in Israel, why do I think that is? And I told him it's a Gemara. Because based on the Gemara, Ksavivri was used Ladvarim Shachoil. So let's say you're a Malamit, and you want to write down Psukim. 
And you don't want that should have a din of a Kedusha of Sifri Kurdish. You write the name of Hashem in Ksav Ivri. Doesn't have the same Kedusha because then it became a Dvarim Shachoyal. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin that, that they started using it, the Kusim were using it. So they started using it for the Dvarim Shachoyal. That's why it's on coins. Whereas if they were writing something Shakedusha, they were writing Savashurs. It's not so simple. Uh, yeah, but, but that's already a, a whole other discussion which we can't have tonight, but I would be glad to talk about that at a different occasion. Yes? Yeah, they probably took it, again, the Yidin were surrounded. So they knew that the real Caleb are going to be taken. So they put what we believe they put decoys. So therefore, whatever they put at the end is not Dafka Raya, that that's what it was. And that's why we don't pass them like Rebbe Lazar. Okay, so a lot of people walk around with this misconception that all the Kalim of the base Hamidish are in the basement of the Vatican. That would be like saying the basement of Miami Beach. There are no basements in Miami Beach. The Vatican's level of water, they cannot make any basements. There's no catacombs, there's no things. The Vatican didn't come to power for hundreds of years after Rome fell. So the, that, the place that the Caleb of the base is not in Rome, in Rome or in the Vatican. Where the Caleb are is in Turkey. We know where they are, some of them. Rav Liashev told me it's better to be in the hands of a Goy than a Yid because it's Asabano. That maybe there's a real artifact there. Maybe one of the things is real. It's the best it's designed the hand from Goy and designed the hand from a Yid. That goes against emotion. Emotion you want to have, everything, right? But there's halachas. A Kalim the Bismish is Asabano. The only Kalim that are not Asabano, the only things that are not Asabano, is something that the Goyim destroyed. The Kaisel was never destroyed, that's as a Din Kedusha. That's a whole other thing. But, 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 a broken piece of stone from the base Hamigdash that was found, Zagdi Gemara in the Darim, Bo Pritzin Bachalalua, has no Din Kedusha. But if something is intact, it's a problem. That's where the issue becomes. So that, that's a whole issue about looking what Hana means. I had once with David Cohen a whole interesting discussion about Hana. Um, but but the, the, we need a, a different night and a different shear to, to talk about what constitutes Isser Hana and relating to these type of items. Yes. Caretaker. Caretaker, that's right. If I do share it, yeah. we have no idea better that they should. When Rabbi Yashif told it to me, I was shocked by what he was saying. He says, he has to pass in halacha. He doesn't go by emotion, right? You know, most people don't know this, but I'm very happy we have a Rosh Bezdin sitting right here. So he'll vouch for what I'm going to say. Most people go to a Din Torah, 95% of what you say by Din Torah has absolutely no relevance in halacha. They walk in, they come, they scream, everything else. Rabbi Alt, am I saying correct? Exactly. 5% of a Din Torah has to do with judging the halacha aspect. But everybody's got to get everything off their chest. You understand? So there's a lot of emotion that's built up. Halacha has nothing to do with emotion. Halacha has to do with the halacha. If the halacha is a favor of one person, the, the dayan is going to say, that's the halacha, that's the psak. 
But people get caught up in the emotional aspect. And Rabbi Asha was the same way. He said what the halacha is. Oh, you don't like the halacha? Well, so have kindness to the Rabbi Yishalayim. I'm going to tell you what the halacha is. This is the problem today because people are caught in emotion. So if the psak din doesn't go your way, there's a beautiful vart. It was just his yard site. Chaf Av was the yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's father, Rabbi Levik. He was Rav and Yaakov Ternislav. He had a very famous saying. He had a lot of din tires in his town. And people didn't like him too much because guess what? They not always ruled his way. So Rabbi used to say, as a man shfalita din a person loses his din He's not screaming why he lost. Why did the other guy win the entire? So again, people get wrapped up with emotional feeling that has absolutely nothing to do with halacha. The halacha is the halacha. And he's going to tell you what the halacha is. I'm going to end my shir with a beautiful story that happened with Rabbi Yashiv and Shimon Paris. Shimon Peres one time came to Rabbi Yashif's sukkah. And he said to Rabbi Yashif, tell me what I could do for you. What could the country do for you? You know, Rabbi Yashif could have said, I want a, 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 I want a pension for a million dollars. He didn't say that. You know what Rabbi Yashif said? On Erev Pesach, there are people who are going to try to go up on Harabais and to be makri of carbon Pesach. Please use the police to stop the Chilul Hashem. So Paris asked him, so what's the problem? So he said to Rabbi Yashif said, a person who goes and angers the Arabs and Harabayis is a Ritzeach. Because if he's going to turn around and go kill a Yid, it's not anymore a shaila, are you allowed to be makri v'karben pesach b'zman hazeh or not? It's a shaila of ritzicha. So when a person is a, a person of halacha, he's not thinking about the emotional aspect. He's thinking about the practicality of the halacha. He's thinking about the practicality of the situation. And if you know that you're going to do something, that's going to anger the Goyim to the point that they're going to go and kill a Yid, you are a Ritzeach. I hope that this shear has opened your eyes a little bit and looking at the world maybe a little bit different and seeing what the musical instruments look like. And we should be zeichet to see the real musical instruments with Biaz Goyal Tzedek B'mher B'yameinu Amen. Shkoyach. Shame, Egan, she retired much as Boston, like a big Ashakach, to Rabbi Deutsch for very inspiring Drosha. I have to give a big Ashakach to the sponsor of tonight's Sheba, Elam Shame, Liv Nishma, Sarav Chaim Yitzhak, Ben of Israel, Alava Shalom, and of Moshe, Ben of Shloim, Alava Shalom. Tanish Bessem Chus, Sarah Chaim. To have the great Schuss to sponsor me this year or to support Egan Shere Taira through our annual dinner upcoming on August 18th by putting an ad in the journal in Mechazek Egan to retire as a bus title throughout the world throughout the year. Call 718-851-8651 or email IST at yeshivanet.com. Rabbi Deutsch's uh, new Sefer on Parsha series on Sefer by Midbar is available for sale as well as the Sefer Bracious which covers a lot of the topics discussed tonight.